Great, thank you. Well, sure. This is one of our gardens that we've done for our clients. So that fencing, because it seems fairly low, does that keep that is kept. Out? That is kept their wildlife out. They have used um, small critter. Um, they also have property fencing on that. Uh, okay. Yeah. That they have a pool, so it's within their pool okay. fencing. And then they have for small critters, they've used the inhumane trap. Um, also, we also do uh, uh, companion plant with the same with the uh, eating of deer and things like that. But uh, birds. And right. Not the, the same question. Exactly. So again, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And we have a lot to, okay, why is it not advancing? Sorry. Oh, now it is, sorry. <laughs> All right, when you're starting and planning a garden, um, there's a lot that can go into it. And it can get overwhelming for some people. I look at it similar to way uh, baking, that there's a certain recipe that you can follow. And in doing so, you'll be able to um, enjoy a successful gardening experience. Um, some of the key recipes uh, or ingredients involve a fertile growing medium, the right sun exposure, uh, a good gardening configuration, and good seed selection. And if you plant it out properly, you'll be able to enjoy some delicious fresh vegetables uh, for your family. So let's start with the soil. Uh, a fertile so growing medium, what makes food nutritious is um, healthy soils lead to higher levels of nutrients in crops. Healthy soils are biologically alive and balanced in mineral and carbon content. Soil organisms play an essential role in breaking down organic matter and other complex molecules. These activities are also linked to processes that lead to the aggregation of soil particles into a friable soil um, structure that's beneficial for growth plants. So what that means is the soil is, it, there's air, there's, if you think about earthworms kind of tunneling through, all those tunnels and stuff um, create air pockets and stuff. So that's all good. You want a soil, if you've ever picked up um, a very wet soil mixture and made a, a you know fist with it and then just dropped it and then it's like a clump on the ground. That's a very dense wet mixture. I have up here, which afterwards, if we have time, you can take a look at the um, the consistency of the soil and you'll see that it's light and it's airy. Um, there's things that we put into it that help, you know, contribute to making it less dense. A good compost can be somewhat dense. So there's things that we add to it to um, break that up, which help store um, water and uh, other nutrients. What do you add? What, what do you add that you add to it? We add vermiculite, which is one of the, we add a coarse vermiculite that holds the uh, nutrients in water. Uh, um, and we add uh, uh, the, um, the earth cast, uh, earthworm castings that adds more, um, nutrients to it, and we'll also add um, sphagnum peat or core. So this, that all helps with um, keeping the moisture in and also the nutrients in. The interconnected activities of soil organisms improve soil stability and underpin the nutrient cycling on a global scale. It's a fact that healthy soils are responsible for the production of foodborne antibodies, minerals, vitamins, phytochemicals, and amino acids, which are all crucial to our human health. The right soil will yield the most nutritious and flavorful food possible. Uh, in the old days, a lot of people would do a lot of hoeing and, and, and rototilling, and still people do practice this. It's, it's common practice. What scientists have discovered is that can be really, really harsh on the soil, and that can be really harsh on the microorganisms, these, the nem nematodes, the earthworms, and so it can actually disrupt it to a point where it's, it does more damage than good. So raised beds, doing practicing raised beds, um, gardening or in containers and stuff, you're not, you're not messing around with the dirt as, as far as having to 
you know, work it that way so that the soil organisms become, because um, what happens is they'll start to go away from that area and not return necessarily. Decomposition of organic matter is the organic content in soil, and decomposing organic material increases the carbon content that's in the soil. So as I was saying before, in our raised beds, we'll take this as, um, we'll use about a half of, of it decompost, we'll add a quarter of it the sphagnum peat, another quarter vermiculite, and then the worm castings. If I'm doing a container, um, the only thing that changes is that I will use core as opposed to the sphagnum meat, uh, peat. The reason being is the core, which is coconut fiber, does not, um, if it dries out, it will, when you re-wet it, it will get wet. Sphagnum peat, if it dries out, doesn't. We use that in the raised beds because very rarely will a raised bed become dried out completely because it is part it is part of the soil becomes part of the earth yep is the sphagnum peat moss different than regular peat moss no oh. it's just the official long word oh. yes oops um. okay <laughs> the next important thing is obviously you need to have the right location for your garden a lot of people don't realize the importance for um, the amount of sunlight when growing vegetables. And knowing and understanding how much sunlight will aid in your success. So food can be picky. So for your fruiting vegetables, like your tomatoes and your eggplants, cucumber squash, vine crops like that, they need a good eight hours. If you find that your vegetables are kind of um, thin, or they're, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Mark? The, when the roots are, not the roots, the, the vines are uh, kind of spindly. spindly. Yeah, that probably means it's not getting enough sun. If you're getting the good eight hours, you're gonna find that your roots are gonna be nice and thick and your, your crops, your tomatoes will come out. Yep. Sorry, I didn't know we were going off soil. Sure. Uh, <laughs> when you start turning over your beds after the winter, in my bed, there's a, some moss. Should I be adding lime to it? Not necessarily. Um, in, I would never add anything to any bed without doing a soil test to see exactly what you need. Because it's not, you know, something like that may not be indicative that that's what you need. So to be on the safe side, do a soil test. There's soil kits that you can buy and literally you can just, it's, it's very, very simple. Um, the other thing is, for the most part, in our beds, the only thing on a yearly basis that we replenish is the compost. The peat and the, the vermiculite, those don't need to be replenished for a good five plus more years. So those, it's, it's the compost, because after each season, the, vet, the fruits and vegetables are getting the nutrients from the compost. That's where, so that's, they're sucking all of their nutrients up, and so they're all in the fruits, and then you've taken them out of the garden, and the soil is now depleted. So. If you're doing succession planting, as I was talking earlier, and your, your lettuce is done, and you want to put in maybe some radish or something else after that, just you need to add a little bit, you know, it doesn't need to be a lot, just a couple handfuls in that area of compost to help replenish the nutrients back in so that um, things will grow nice and healthy. Root crops, they can take a little less. Um, they'll take about six hours. Uh, lettuce and, and other greens, they can take the semi-shade or diffused light, meaning if it's not direct light, maybe you have a sunny area and the, uh, the sun's bouncing off um, into your, you know, the garden. Uh, that's a wonderful place to do lettuce and, and other greens that are tender, have a tendency to get burned out. But there is a variety of herbs and vegetables for pretty much any sunlight situation, and you can enjoy having a garden. So there are many different types of gardens depending upon you know, your, your needs. Uh, we recommend to a lot of uh, clients containers to start in containers. Uh, a lot of people I don't think are 
that they just think that containers are good for, for flowers, but they don't realize how much food can actually be grown in containers. Um, in containers, you need, don't use potting soil. You need to have the same kind of, as I mentioned, um, a rich compost, rich in, um, soil, just to add um, the core and the vermiculite, and you're all set. Um, these are pictures of self-watering containers. They don't really water themselves, but they have reservoirs underneath that have four gallons. So it creates a kind of capillary system that helps keep um, the moisture level a little bit more consistent. Uh, I highly recommend these self-watering containers. They don't dry out as fast. And uh, I know last summer we only had two days that were over 90, but the summer before we had a week and a half. So. Uh, if you're familiar with working with terracotta containers, you know how quickly they can dry out. So, um, and there are kits on the market to convert containers that you might already have and enjoy. Um, I think gardeners.com or Gardener Supply uh, has something like that. Yep. How about those little bees? You know how they come in a container that you know suck up the water, and then they can because I have really hot sun mm -hmm. and some of my window boxes. I haven't used those, and I'm not exactly sure what they contain. So on an organic level, I'm not exactly positive. It's something to look into if you're concerned about organic. Um, the the way that the some of the other kits work, it's just like this little thing that goes in, you know, and it creates a reservoir in your already existing container, um, so that and a, like a, a pipe will come up from inside the soil. Um, I don't know if you can see it on, maybe there's another picture. Having the right container size makes all the difference in the world. Depending upon the plant, you can have, um, as I said, beans or cabbage or cucumbers or radish that can grow in anywhere from a one to a five gallon. Um, knowing the right depth is, is good. Strawberries and herbs uh, need, you know, and greens, they're not, they're shallow rooted. They can go in a four to six inch deep um, container. Uh, but your rooting, your fruiting, and your root vegetables definitely need to be in a, a twelve plus um, inch container. And I have uh, these are all in my hand. Right? <coughs> so there's the, uh, the the watermelon we grew. It was in a twenty inch size pot. So we just had it in a sunny part in our yard. One of the other things I like about containers is I can move them around if I need to. Uh, the grow box here has a pepper and tomatoes in it, and we do companion planting where we mix in the herbs and flowers, so that's not only to make it look pretty, but it brings in the beneficial, the, the bees and the insects and stuff to help pollinate the, the vegetables. We also recommend the smart, uh, smart pots. They're a fabric container that are breathable. They allow the roots to root into the ground. Uh, but they can be put on a, on a hardscape surface as well. Um, I had cabbage and a whole bunch of other stuff. I've grown tomatoes, peppers, everything in there. Do you, do you use these for potatoes? Yep. I love using these for potatoes because they're just a lot easier to harvest. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy when you're planting potatoes in these. You just you put the soil down, you put your, your seed potatoes in, you cover them up, you wait for some sprouts to come up. And once the, the sprouts are over about you know two inches or three inches above the soil level, you add more soil, and you keep going until you're up to the top of the pot. How, how close together are you putting the potatoes? In? in a pot like these, in the for, in the um, the ones that are made, they, I think it's a 15 gallon pot that they recommend for the potatoes. I usually put like four to five seed potato, uh, seed potatoes in it. Okay. So I'll spread it out, <coughs> you know, in the pot the one in the center. And you get a nice harvest, I mean, you know. And it's a lot easier to harvest. Dump out the pot and then, you know, fold up the bag and put it in the garage. Easier, okay. Well, also, sometimes when you're digging for your potatoes and then you land up hitting one, you know, so it's just a lot easier. You're not gonna destroy your potatoes. Lettuces are great. We've grown lettuces in containers up until through uh, the fall into January. You know, simply by throwing a, you know, just another container or something if I know there's going to be bad weather. Um, so it's very easy to do, and, and um, you can really enjoy having fresh greens. Well, greens are one of the, the biggest things. 
from the time you cut it off at the soil level, you're on a time clock of when the nutrients start to get depleted because most vegetables are made you know, 70 to 90 percent water. So the nutrient levels, all the travel time of everything that we get in the store, it, by the time we get it, there's really no nutrients in it. So greens are really, I highly, I, I'm always recommending my clients to, because this is where you can really get some huge nutrient bang for your buck. What size pot would that be? That's a 20 inch round. And I have a tendency, sometimes I overcrowd. I mean, probably if you look at the thing, it probably should have maybe two less uh, lettuces in there. They did find, also, as if you can see, now that I know I'm on camera, <laughs> that's a uh, tomato plant in there, which eventually, over time, took over the plant. And it's a volunteer. Vo no, that was not a volunteer. Not a volunteer? No, that was specifically placed The great there. thing about those pots, too, is that you can put them on a porch and watch them rabbit. So there's, this, is, this is the size pot. So that's a 20 inch round pot. Um, in it has a tomato plant. This is a, um, a grafted uh, tomato plant, which went wild and I needed to tie it up to the house. Is that so particularly squirrels up there? I have never have a problem with squirrels. What about chipmunks? I have not had a problem with chipmunks. Mm -hmm. We have chipmunks too. And we do have chipmunks. Um, between the companion plantings, uh, the, you know, I'm in a fenced area, but chipmunks and squirrels and skunks, I also have five dogs, but they've gotten skunked, like, at the bottom of that staircase there. So, the critters get in. I've, I've been in my garden thinking it was one of my dogs moving my sunflower, and it was a, it was a, uh, what was it? A groundhog. <laughs> I crept up behind it thinking it was a dog, it was a groundhog. <laughs> and, uh, so I put containers of mint around the back side of the sunflower garden. That's where he had gotten into, and I never saw him again. So there's certain organic ways that we can work and um, try to uh, get around Mother Nature and her, her critters. A raised bed will allow you to easily control the soil. You can also um, build it to whatever level uh, that you desire. We've built beds that literally are this high so that people don't have to bend. Um, so. Do you, in a bed that high, do you add something? You don't put all of that in the soil, do you? No. On a bed that high, what we'll do is we'll put in a, an eco mulch layer, which is very economical. It just it's like a mulch, mm -hmm. and so, and then we'll build. So the top part of it is the soil that we're talking about. Um, there are gardens that we have that are actually on legs. It all depends on you know the client and, and the look that they're going for. But no, we won't fill because that doesn't make economically any sense. Well, like for drainage and stuff too, do you need to add anything in the bottom? Like no, the eco mulch because everything eventually does you know continues to mulch down and everything. Yeah. The drainage is fine. The eco mulch is a it's an actually light uh, uh, mixture, so it definitely helps with the drainage on it, as far as that's concerned. It wouldn't um, cause any kind of pooling up top or anything. And then over time, so everything lands up mulching down and then on a yearly basis, we just on the top part put the, um, the amendment of the compost. Sorry, we're not in the compost sure. Can you buy compost? Absolutely. <laughs> we don't, we, we, we do compost, but we don't, can't make enough compost for our clients either. So, um, if you're a New Canaan resident, uh, you can certainly use our compost in New Canaan that they offer for free. I highly recommend it. It's very good compost. Um, there are bags of compost that you can bat buy. Uh, I recommend uh, looking up. Um, Coast of Maine is an organic source. Omri. OMRI is the Organic Management Review Institute. This is like the, the consumer report of organic. So if there's something that you're looking for, whether it be a fertilizer or a compost or a pesticide, omri. I think it's omri.org. Um, you can go on there. They're a free service. You can just it has a search area and you can put you know compost or fertilizer or 
So you don't have to worry about the compost that the town provides being organic. I mean, I know it's leaves that have decomposed, but as far as what other stuff might get mixed in there, the yeah, process I it in the past, and then somebody said, "Oh, you don't, you know." The process uh, that um, the uh, that the town of New Canaan goes through to compost of what we do is very involved. They spend a lot of money on it, and it's it's very good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, it's been sitting up for a long time. It's been rained on. So anything that's it's, it's been processed. It's I mean, in as much as anything is going to be able to be okay, and the fact that people say that it's still got a soft roof and it's ready to go, I think it's okay. Good. Any more so than anything else that's been compost. If you go and you look at those. Heads and monsters. Yeah. <laughs> if you go look at the, the the piles, our own piles here in New Canaan and stuff, I mean, they're steaming. It's, it's, that's. Those have reached, I mean, they've, like they've reached good. a certain degrees that have that the burned point. out the pathogens that if anybody's worried about, like, you know, from runoff or anything like that. The first garden we built in this town years ago together. Yep. That's was all we used. All we used. Was the town stuff. And I can tell you, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm not recommending that necessarily as the only thing you use. Right, but, but it's, it's, yeah, it, right. you know, and it's very, it's, it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> Pardon? If you're not a town resident, what are you doing? So you, the, you, I would um, coast of Maine. There's, there's, you can buy it by the bag. I, I, um, I told Rita that they were using it once, but the, there's what coast of Maine makes really. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jump in, but coast of Maine makes really great product, and it's not Scotch Glen with the lobster brand. You can buy that pretty much anywhere. You can even buy it at Home Depot for right. a German or whatever. I forget. But uh, Gannon's Nursery. If you don't know that. It's Fairfield. G A N I N. Right on the coast road, they're a master nursery uh, designate, designated uh, place. And even though Coast of Maine makes the product they're going to talk about, you can't even buy it wholesale from Coast of Maine. We have to buy it through them because they're like very specific group of retailers that like to use it. Uh, it's called Bumper Run. I said, you know, what can you do? It's like a dart. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just bought a pallet with that for my uh, for my pickup truck this afternoon. It's hilarious. It's 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 a, it's a mix of all kinds of great compost. I mean, composts usually uh, are one dimensional if you're talking about leaves. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's, and even commercially available compost is usually one dimensional. This is a mix of everything from bag and peat to, uh, to, to lobster shell to, uh, you know. And it's a micro. Um, micro or, yeah. It's got chicken poop, worm yep. poop, all the other poops. It's nicely balanced for vegetables. It, it's specifically for vegetables. It's not. A, I wouldn't. It, you That's wouldn't want to put it in your flower bed. Um, yep. And regarding rinsing, is there a concern uh, with uh, plastic pots? I, I don't know if those are concrete pots you were showing us. Are they plastic pots? Those were plastic pots. Um, not had a concern about leaching from um, any of the uh, the from the plastic um, from the pots and such. Back to town, jumping sure. in. Um, what about like pesticides? You know, people they spray their trees with ticks and stuff like that. So I know you said that you know the organisms will burn off, but what about the non-organism stuff, like the pesticides? You know, can you just spray them and then the leaves fall down and then? Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's certainly something that happens. Um, with the town composting, the process of that it's gone through, it gets hot enough, and it's that it's those pathogens, those those things have well, burned. Well, yeah, but the the diseases and the pesticides that stuff could possibly burn off. If you, I, I've we've been using it, have not had a problem. Um, not a problem with it, but you don't know how the problem. Yeah, is. no, no, I understand what you're saying, and and and. Leaching is a huge problem because you could be doing everything organic on your property, and your neighbor next door could be, you know, using, you know, Roundup like crazy. And because of what's going on on the soil underneath, that's why also we recommend raised beds so that you're not, you know, you're raising things up above that, and you're not dealing with as much as what's leaching. Um, I can't really, you know, for sure say that, you know, that that. Isn't a part of the compost you know, they anywhere? Do they test for that? No, you know I don't. I'm not sure. I, I have a uh, letter going out to them to find out if they can put out more information for local gardeners like us about the um, 
specifics about the compost. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's on my, my list of things that I'm trying to work with with the town to see if you know, we can get some more information so, you know, some more, you know, with visibility. Yep. A few slides back, uh, the screen said never use potting soil for a vegetable garden. And frankly, I don't even know what the composition of potting soil is. But assuming that we were to treat it with all the usual additives of vermiculite and worm, whatever. What Most potting mean? soil already has like some kind of vermiculite or perlite. You'll hear that word a lot. And that's the other white little substance that you see. The difference between vermiculite and perlite is perlite will hold water but not the nutrients. Uh, potting soil is really basically set for flowers and so it doesn't have the nutrient content. If you wanted to take pot, I, w I would say in pot not potting soil alone. If you want to use potting soil, then make sure you're adding compost to it. Because potting soil alone doesn't have the nutrients necessary for growing um, nutrient rich food. Can you use topsoil though in this composition? Not alone. Yes, you can right. use topsoil with it. Topsoil is really, really dense. Right. So if you use, you know, you want to mix. What's like the, the next? Like Pardon? What, what would like the percentage mix be between like topsoil and mineral organic? Um, it really depends. I mean, uh, you know, on a topsoil. More than half. Yeah, more, more than, than half. half. No more than no half. More than half. Depends on how big your I mean. It well, for like a four by four raised bed. For a, for a four by four raised bed, then I would put like, you know, half potting. I would ha have half um, compost, and then I would mix in um, the ratios of the of the topsoil with um, the vermiculite. Well, topsoil is a moving target. So, I mean, we get something from a, a place up in Fairfield uh, called Green Cycle, which is uh, it's called Topsoil Plus, which is topsoil mixed with the eco mulch that she was talking about. And so we know what the content of that is. We know how friable it is and friable means how loose it is. But that, you know, topsoil is... Yeah, if you're going out to the back of your property and just pulling up some topsoil, that... Yeah. Somebody could, could deliver it in a dump, dump truck and it could be just a big clump of... Right. Um, the place that that uh, Mark mentioned is now called, I believe, the New England Harvest, yeah, called and they're they're in Fairfield. Yeah, they're growing a lot of harvest. They're great. Uh, the Dunn's is another great neighborhood right there. Um, when setting up your raised beds, we always recommend to keep the beds narrow. Um, we don't recommend anything lar uh, wider than four feet. You want to be able to always reach into your garden, not walk into it. Um, by walking into a garden, you compress the soil, and uh, that destroys the roots and, and the microorganisms that we were discussing earlier. If you can't get to all four sides of your garden, I recommend then nothing w wider than three feet, or what you're comfortable reaching into. And we always recommend to start small. A four by four, an amazing amount of food can be grown in a four by four. If you start small and you find that you're successful and you want to add on, then more containers or another addition uh, in the um, subsequent se uh, seasons, then it's certainly easy to do. If you're growing or want to grow uh, zucchini, I always recommend, then we pop to a four by eight. Unless you're willing to put it in the corner of a four by four and have it trail out. If it's gonna trail out into your lawn where you're gonna mow, um, then that wouldn't work. Zucchinis can get really big and take over, and they're beautiful and wonderful, but they do need um, some room. Watering is very important. We always recommend um, a drip irrigation type system as opposed to uh, the, the sprayers that go like this. When you spray, you have the tendency to um, you get the leaves wet, which can build up uh, disease and um, also if you're watering during a certain time of day, it can cause foliage burn. So if you're gonna water by hand, we always recommend watering low, right 
at the roots and the base just so that it avoids that. Um, we water early in the morning before the sun comes, you know, before the sun gets too hot. Uh, so, you know, before 9.30 in the morning at least, or late in the evening. Uh, morning, at least, you know, during the day, the vegetables and the plants can dry out. And Um, when first establishing um, the garden, when you're first putting in your seeds and your starts and stuff, you need to be a little bit more diligent about the water. You want to make sure that, the, the, that you're watering long enough so that um, the bed's getting a good two or three inches of, you know, of dampness. You don't want it to get too wet, but you want it to, you know, to get fully damp. That's why the soaker hoses are great because they're right there at the bases. Things will get really damp. The lower things go, your roots are going to go and pull into that. I usually pull back on the watering as things, you know, start getting going. Um, so in the beginning, I usually water all twi twice a day. I'll be out there in the morning and in the evening as things are getting established. And then usually about a month into it, I'll start to pull back. And it also then depends on Mother Nature. You know, and how much she's helping. Um, my sister, who knows nothing about gardening, called me once, and <laughs> it's been raining for like a week. And she was like, "What do I do?" And I'm like, "Go outside and stand there with an umbrella." <laughs> she's like, "What?" She's ten years younger than me, so I can have some fun with her sometimes. But I was like, "It's okay. Mother Nature sometimes does this, and we'll be okay." You know. Um, it would be interesting to see what kind of season we get considering the winter we got. So now we've talked about location and garden setup. Now let's get into proper planning of the actual garden. When we plant, we put together polycultures. And what that is, it's an organic method that brings in a variety to the garden. And it breaks up a monoculture, which helps deter disease and bad bug infestation. Now monoculture is when you just get a flat of you know, tomatoes from the, the garden center, and you put the whole flat in the bed. You just monocrop, one crop, nothing else. A polyculture brings in other things such as flowers and, um, and uh, herbs. Polycultures help eliminate the need for chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Companion plants can enhance the beauty and health of your garden and help work in harmony with nature. So companion planting, it's also referred to as polycultures, intensive cropping, intercropping, square foot gardening. But all it does is it breaks up the monoculture and it deters the disease and bad bug infestation. So this is helping us keep away from having to put pesticides and stuff in the garden. The scientific foundation for building a polyculture it's a symbiotic nitrogen fixation. This is peas actually will take air, um, nitrogen from the air, and they convert it into the soil to be used for the plants. Uh, trap cropping is where one crop lures another, uh, a, a certain pest away from the main crop. So nasturtiums do this for squash. There's physical spatial interactions where you plant taller vegetables with shorter vegetables to shade the shorter vegetables. So lettuce um, coupled with um, tomato plants. Beneficial habitat, um, habitat and um, security via diversity. So what that means is by not putting in the one crop and by building a, mon a polyculture, you're lessening your risk of losing or, or having a disease take over the whole entire bed. Um, if a plant gets diseased, it's not going to spread it to the other plants. Usually plants are, you know, disease is um, specific to that specific family. Um, so like your tomato blight. Uh, I wouldn't plant tomatoes with potatoes because if you do that, they're in the same family. They also can be affected by the same blight, and you could lose your whole crop in one fell swoop. We had a person call us once who was all upset. 
She'd come back from vacation. She had this beautiful bed of 14 tomatoes, and they were dying, and she didn't know what was going on. And we went over to the house, and we took a look, and she just had the tomato plants. There was nothing else in the bed. She had all sorts of beds and everything, but she had monocropped everything. And after talking to her for a while, and uh, she had said that, uh, you know, over the years, this, the tomato crop had been lessening, and it just hadn't been doing as well. And we asked her if she had plant, uh, if she had ever rotated the bed and planted the tomatoes over here as opposed to over there. And she said she hadn't. So we took soil samples and, what had, and we took a plant and we sent it off to Yukon. And they looked at the plant and, and the soil and it was like the soil borne disease had built up because she had kept the, planting her tomatoes in the same bed year after year after year. So even though they were growing and she was putting the soil amendments in, and she, th she thought she was doing everything right. The one thing she wasn't doing was rotating the crop. So the soil, even if you mend your bed, you know, even if you take out some of the, the soil and then put in the new amendments, um, soil-borne diseases can build up and they go very low. Um, so things will grow, but maybe they're not looking as good or maybe you're not getting as much as you used to. So if you're starting to see that sort of thing, it's probably um, having to do, especially if you've been keeping your crop in the same spot. It can be difficult because people are like, I don't have the space, especially if you have a four by four garden. Um, and even I recommend rotating in those spaces. Uh, you know, Don't put that tomato plant in the same exact spot. Move it to the other side of that four by four. I mean, as, as much as you can do, is much more beneficial than, than not doing it at all. Uh, the other, um, there's biochemical pest suppression. What this means is that plants like marigolds do things on a soil level. Uh, they, submit, they emit a, uh, an enzyme which deters root eating nem nematodes. And on the above level, um, they bring in the pollinators. So, that's another example of companion planting. We've been very successful with doing um, beans and companions. The three sisters, um, corn, bean, and squash. Last year, uh, I was finally successful in growing corn. I've been trying for three years. <laughs> and I just, it, it was growing, and then, I, and then I'd take it off the thing, and then it was either too late, or um, Mark had been trying over a few years, or the critters had gotten to it because he left it out too. A lot of times when the critters get stuff, that means that it's ripe and it needs to be taken off earlier. If the you're words, in your- The words, I'll pick that tomorrow, should never grow. And if you food. say that to yourself, go back and pick it right then. <laughs> because tomorrow, you might see that bite out by the, the, the chipmunk or the squirrel. Um, One bite per tomato. That, <laughs> what that is, is um, most likely it is birds, and they're yeah, not, they're they're not they're hungry. Chipmunks. Birds will do that um, because they're thirsty. And a bird bath, even on your property, will help alleviate that, where they just take a little, psh, they, they're looking for the liquid. Very likely, yeah, the chipmunks. Yeah, the chipmunks, the best thing and the only thing for chipmunks, I mean, besides certain companion plants, uh, are the humane traps. And they only need to be used for a few weeks because they learn. This is not a place for me to come because every time I do, I get caught. But if there's so many of them out there. It, it, we've we've <laughs> used them, it's true. I mean, the, the garden in the front, in the beginning one, they used the humane traps. Um, I think they've told me that they needed to use them for about a month. And then, I mean, they kept them out, but they noticed the activity level just you take them somewhere? Or? You, yeah, you take the trap. They're humane. How far is that from chipmunk meat? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear Waveney is popular. Waveney, Waveney's a great place. Mead Park. park. <laughs> Any of the parks are fine. Uh, um, in companion planting, uh, just like there's certain plants that get along really well, there are plants that don't. Um, peppers don't like to be with beans. And I have a lot of that on the, uh, on the handout. So herbs, 
these are one of the best companion plants. We always put herbs in the garden, uh, not only because it's, it's pretty, but they attract the beneficial pollinators. And herbs work as organic pesticides. Um, and they, they crowd out weeds. Or, oregano is a wonderful all-around herb to use. It, it's a great cover. It, it gets the weeds out. And um, on, a pesticide, you know, on a pest level, it, it, uh, it deters a lot of pests. Flowers like nasturtiums, um, they're wonderful um, in using in the garden, as I said before. They work with uh, squash as a uh, trap crop. Flowers bring in beneficials. They bring in the, the, the butterflies. And um, <coughs> don't forget about edible flowers. Um, there's just as many edible flowers out there. Um, Johnny jump ups and nasturtiums as well. They're also. Um, edible flowers, the, the violets, the, the, what do you call it, the Johnny Jump Up. When you're selecting your seeds, one of the things to look for is this little logo, the AAS winners. Um, AAS is the All-American Selection. They've been tested all throughout um, by gardeners throughout the, the country as far as um, their ability to be um, you know, good grower, prolific. Have fun when you're selecting your seeds. There's seeds like drunken, frizzy-headed woman lettuce. <laughs> you know, who have you? This was ours. This is what we grew. <laughs> and that was the, the cover of the seed selection. So it worked for great. I, when I first saw that, I, I laughed my head off. And I thought, I, how could I not do that? <laughs> Look for organic seeds. You'll see um, OG. Um, there's a lot of different catalogs. There's Johnny's Selected Seeds. Uh, there's Annie's Heirloom Seeds. You could just simply do a Google search for um, organic seeds. Uh, locally here in Connecticut, there's Comstock and Fair. They've just been, um, they've, they're, they're grouped now with rareseeds.com, but they're local up in uh, Weathersfield. And they have some great harvest uh, and seed swapping. Uh, activities up there. And we were hoping in the fall that uh, we'll be able to do uh, some more of these and do some. Uh, and the seed bank, the seed bank. Well, we have the seed bank here, but also, uh, so if you ever want to learn how to uh, collect your seeds and stuff like that. Yep. You have a seed library in Thomas too. Yes, yes. The New Canaan Library has started their seed library, which is a great um, source. And there are uh, brochures here on the table. Oh, about wonderful. About that. Oh, good. Uh, Um, see, also when you come across seeds, you may, you may find F1s, and these are hybrid seeds. And I know a lot of people might get confused about, because we, we hear about GMO seeds all, all the time, and, and everybody's, you know, we don't want GMO. Hybrid seeds are different than GMO. This is, this is back, gardening, um, gardeners for many, many years have combined um, through many natural ways, um, brought together and built plants that have become stronger and disease, more disease re, um, uh, you know, resistant through um, doing it, breeding plants you know, the old fashioned way. Um, so you'll see these recognized, they might be, uh, you might see it labeled as hybrid or an F1. And that's simply what that means. And it's, it's organic, it, I mean it's not organic, but it's, it's fine. Heirlooms. I've been to the farmer's market every so often, and I was there once, and this woman was picking tomatoes, and she said, do heirlooms really taste any different? And she had about five people on her about, like, are you kidding? <laughs> heirlooms do taste very different. The seeds, uh, the, the selection of stuff that we get in the supermarket, the seeds that are selected uh, for commercial produce, they're, those are not selected for taste. Those are selected for transportability, uh, for durability, and all the things that our food needs to, our commercial food needs to go through in order to make get to our, our, our supermarkets and look good. Heirlooms, um, heirloom seeds are just, they're more flavorable. They're, they're just 
there's just an, such an array of, of tastes and flavors and colors and styles. Um, so have fun in looking at the, the different and trying different things because uh, you'll taste. I, I, I had for the first time last year the the uh, black cherry tomatoes. Oh, so good, and the sun gold. I mean, there's just it's just so good. <laughs> Crop rotation. There's four major families that benefit from crop rotation. Your cabbage family, your carrot group, your cucumbers and squashes, and your tomatoes and eggplant. These are the groups that really, when I'm planning a garden, that I plan out and consistently think that I need to, to turn around. So this is a diagram of one of my client's gardens. She's got a, an eight by eight garden. And so year one, this is how we planted our garden. And the legumes, as you see, I rotate the legumes. The legumes are helping add the nitrogen back into the soil, the peas and the beans and stuff, and they like to do that. So I rotate those just so that each part of the garden is going to get a little bit more of that as well. Is there any questions about crop rotation? When setting up a garden, as I said, like it can be hard if you're in your own four by four, but even setting up smaller beds, a lot of people, you know, will have these big beds. It's even better to have just a bunch of smaller beds so you can work your crop rotation. So here's one of our clients' gardens. She's got four beds, three of the four by fours, and then she's got one four by eight. And that makes it easy for us to plant her garden. Before going out to the garden, I map my garden. I have my seeds. I know my families, so this way everything's all planned out. So I literally go out with the map and my garden, and I put my seed selections down, and then I plant from there. And that way, I have a record of it, so um, I can go back to that and uh, look at it in the you know, future. Um, sometimes my markers get uh, you know, sun-dried, and I can't read what was there, and <laughs> I have a map at least I can go look at. What did, I, what did I plant there? So mapping out is, is just, it's an easier way for you to go about things. Uh, know if you're gonna use the big box stores that um, uh, the plant starts that are there have been chemically treated so that, they, that they're gonna be there for a long time. And um, so most of those have been chemically treated. We always recommend either just going straight to seed or using a local source. The farmer's market is a great place to pick up some um, plant starts or your local nursery. Oops. Also, when you're planting, when you've got it all mapped out and you know, okay, I'm gonna need a trellis for the cucumbers or I'm gonna need something for the beans, so that way you have everything in place. I don't put things, actually when I plant my tomatoes will put the um, supports in with the, with the start so, so that I'm not going to break in, wait for it to get you know, to a point where it needs the support and then put it in and possibly you know, destroy any roots. So it might look a little funny <laughs> first that you've got these supports um, up and there's nothing there but it makes it a lot easier as that, especially some of the vining tomatoes as it's going up, that you're dealing with supporting it already um, with the support there. And beans will take over. Uh, this is one of my supports I made in my welding class and we shouldn't see it by the end of the season. Um, what is on the, on the last slide, what's on the right? Is that a support for tomatoes? This? No, on the last slide. Oh. On the far right. On the far right. Oh. Nope. Oops. That one. Is that for tomatoes or? What? Oh, right. it's talking about your, your. Oh, my thing? Yeah. That's a bean trellis. Okay. This? I'm and sorry. Those, are those little hooks? No, this is actually, I made this. I take a welding class. Um, and uh, it was just a, an obelisk I made. And then I put it where the beans were. I figured uh, I knew. It would vine up there. Oh, so, so yeah, and then the beans went first, and then the marigolds 
uh, not the marigolds, the morning glories oh. took over. That's, wow. the sa that's the same thing on the yes. right that you saw oh. on the last slide. That's just what it looks like after. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I started welding because I got frustrated with some of uh, the supports out there, and it's like I needed to make my own. Other ways to approach when you're planning a garden, if you're not sure where to start, uh, think of it in terms of a themed garden, whether it be a salad garden, a salsa garden, or an Asian garden, your t Italian tomato garden, or just a simple perennial herb garden. Some people like to keep the herbs separate. Some people just want to grow herbs. Um, I highly recommend if you are growing uh, vegetables to include the herbs amongst them as well. The proper planning. Uh, this is kind of a guideline. Obviously, this year we had a little bit of a delay. Uh, I'm usually able to put peas into the ground sometime around St. Patrick's Day. We had a lot of snow this year, and the thing, everything was frozen. I just got my peas into the ground this weekend. So we're a little, little delayed. But the general rule of thumb, potatoes can go into the ground when you see the dandelions in bloom. You want to make sure for the warm weather crops like beans and eggplants and tomatoes and peppers that we are well past a, a frost and so that you, you usually you know um, way after mother's day about a week after mother's day depends on sometimes mother's day ends up being early so and things like garlic it's a, like every other bulb it's a fall planting crop So a few little things about organic land care. We were talking about the critters before. Um, mint is great to deter a lot of um, critters. Uh, if you're having problems with moles and voles and things that crawl up from underneath, uh, we, when we put our gardens in, we use um, um, it's called hardware cloth. It's, it's far from cloth. It's, it's wire. It's, it's very hard wire so that they can't dig from underneath. Uh, small animal fencing, this, this animal fencing in this type of garden, this will keep out the rabbits and, and the small critters that hop like that, um, dogs, children. Um, there's the humane catch and release traps that we discussed. And then there's also the ultrasonic um, devices that can, if you're having moles problems, they can go into the ground, they emit some kind of sound that kind of deter. Um, yep. Anything to prevent cats from roaming around? Cats. Um, mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, <laughs> the fencing. Especially in the beginning when the, the seeds are planted. And right. Growing, so. Right. It, have, you, have you used fencing? No. We use we, Because we have a cat. But with our dogs, too, we have to fence to keep them out from the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning because the compost. They, they love the compost. The compost. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we have we have five dogs and one cat, and we've been using the fencing. Um, when I don't fence the garden, I always have a dog rolling around in the compost. What's a um, portable kennel fence? Like excuse me. What about the portable kennel fence? Yeah, one of the one of the nice things that uh, you can look for um, there's there's a it's it's um, it's a it's a dog fence. Literally, it's very inexpensive. It's twenty-five or thirty dollars, you know, on Amazon. It's dog fencing. It's the, like two feet tall. They, they have the three feet tall, so it all depends on what you're trying to keep out. Um, I find that putting those around some of the gardens is just as easy um, as some of the other stuff that can be used. So, the corner fences for those beds. Do they have a piece that you hook a, a fence like yes. under? Yes. Yes. And then you can take the fencing down so you can get into it. Some of the other um, things that you can use to keep critters away, sometimes during certain times, um, you know, the birds, you can put row covers. Uh, you don't have to keep that stuff on all season long. Let, sim similar to the way I said, like the humane traps, they only need to be there for, you know, a month's time. Sometimes they just need to be there for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, the wildlife kind of just realizes I'm not going to get anything. And then they move on. Patty, she might get stuck in the netting that I put over the strawberry beds. 
Oh, that was special. Caught it hit my ground ground and got caught with it on its top. Now I was like, oh, what? I've been trying to get rid of this thing, but now I don't want to try there. Well, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> Birds, they have like reflector tape. Um, I simply went to the toy store and got like the pinwheel, and for you know dollar ninety nine, I still have three of my four pin pinwheels in the garden still flapping around. So they survived this winter. They've been out there all winter long, and then they have the the owls. So don't let the critters keep you from having a vegetable garden. I've heard a lot of people say, it. I can't have a garden. Um, deer, we all have deer. Burlap sacks of human hair and dog fur are extremely effective. Um, we have these little sacks that we fill up with, uh, you know, human hair and dog. You know, as I said, I have five dogs, and I've put them around the garden, just tied them up, literally, to the side. I've stuck them in the containers that um, got attacked, and the deer leave them alone. Their scent, they they smell the scent, and they go away. So um, gravel paths are also a deterrent. Um, we'll do a lot of gravel paths, and we'll put some of the larger river stone down. They don't like the shifting of it underneath their hoof. So just realize with organic land care, um, you're working with Mother Nature. So it's, it's kind of like we're trying to strive for a balance. Um, Know that a lot of things that can be used on the market will um, will actually do harm to um, good bugs as well as bad bugs. So we're sort of striving for that um, that middle ground. I mentioned um, Omni, Omri. I highly recommend them as a source. So in closing, I just want everybody to enjoy an, an enjoyable gardening year. Um, there's nothing like planting a seed and watching it grow and then being able to enjoy a delicious meal or two from it. You grow things like garlic, um, you'll be able to enjoy not only the skates, um, but who wouldn't like to have a refrigerator filled with things um, that you can can and, and eat with your family and friends. So. These are just some of the pictures of all the harvests that we've enjoyed. Does anybody have any questions regarding anything that I might have talked about tonight? Yep. Um, just around um, the soil for drainage, um, for the vermiculite, do any of these stand in the soil and can kill a vermiculite and that would get into it potentially not have a problem with contamination from the, you know, having mined the vermiculite to um, put in the soil and contamination that would make it. You're going to find you're going to find your sand in the soil and kill it off. But I mean, when we buy it, I mean, it's, it's the stuff that we buy from the place. And the empirical, when I clean my pickup truck out, mm -hmm. in the back I've got a liner. And when I'm hose using the, the power washer, the last one that comes out, it's sand. So I have heard about people saying that it adds like a bag of sand mm -hmm. every year. I wouldn't personally. Mining vermiculite, they, you get to keep that for like 20,000 degrees or something, and then it pops like popcorn. So I, I have no concerns about anything being involved in that. NOFA, and which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association, still it, vermiculite is they use vermiculite. It's organic. They don't they don't have any worries about um, you know what you had mentioned. We we have to get out of this. Well, one yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's we, five we, after we, eight. If anybody has any questions, we'll be in the lobby. We can go in the lobby and, and, and talk to you for as long as we want. But I, the library really needs us out here. And Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate everybody coming. And if you have any questions, please email us. Or, well, as Mark said, we'll be in the hallway.